plan was to give uh, uh, Congressman Swazi about a half hour to uh, um, speak about what he's heard, what his thoughts and impressions are. Um, um, you don't have a half hour. <laughs> Could I turn this back to you and uh, ask if you would uh, um, uh, share with us um, your thoughts about what you've heard this evening? So let me first uh, join the chorus of voices congratulating you, Dr. Marquette. It's really you know, a brief ceremony honoring you for this, but we know that this is a lifetime that you've devoted to serving other people. And I can't imagine there's so many ups and downs uh, throughout your entire life uh, that brought you to this, this stage of your life. And uh, I want to congratulate you and, and Ruth on this great honor that is so richly deserved. Uh, and uh, I just can't imagine all the different times that you had an idea that people scoffed at, uh, but you kept on fighting to really change the world uh, with the ideas that you've pushed forward and the hard work that accompanied all of that. So let's thank Dr. Burkett and Ruth again. <laughs> For a long, long journey to bring you to this two-hour ceremony. I want to thank, thank Steve Pagalas for inviting me to the Steve Pagalas show this evening. I can't believe I'm getting CLE credits for this. <laughs> and so are you guys. Uh, but, you know, the, the title of tonight's program was Can We Identify Bipartisan Common Ground That Will Deliver Quality and Safe Medical Care to All Americans? The problem is we didn't discuss the Republicans. And, you know, uh, Dick Gottfried has got a big challenge to try and get the Republicans in the state Senate to support what he's been trying to do over the past, I'm sure for his lifetime, but certainly in the past three years, in trying to bring a, a single payer universal health care to New York State. And the, the same challenges in uh, the United States government. They won, they're running things. And we have to understand what it is they're saying, and we have to eschew this idea of what's happening in today's culture where we're all living in our echo chambers, and we're listening to people that agree with ourselves, and the people that support uh, Trump are watching Fox News, and, and the people that don't are watching MSNBC, and we're all getting madder and madder all the time, and we're not talking to each other. People are, you know, defriend de their uh, Facebook friends because they can't believe that they voted that way. I'm not even gonna talk to them. I, I, it's so shocking to me that they behave that way. I'm not gonna talk to them anymore. People don't go to family parties because they're concerned about their relatives uh, that voted differently than they did. They're shocked by the whole thing. And, you know, we, that's not going to work. America will not work that way unless we engage with each other and try to understand where each other is coming from. There's 105 million full-time jobs in the United States of America. Of those 105 million full-time jobs, 59 million people make less than $50,000 a year. 86 million make less than $75,000 a year. So when you see those little spots of blue on the map and the rest of it's all red, we've got to learn to understand what's going on in the rest of the country. People that are voting against their economic interests, people that would benefit tremendously from the bill that, that Dick is proposing uh, and others are proposing at the federal level, that would never support it. So we have to understand each other, we have to learn to communicate with each other, we have to stop just living in our little bubbles and reach out to people that are moderate and reasonable and willing to have a conversation and stop writing people off because you voted that way, you're from that party, you'll never, we can't, we can't even talk about it anymore. And it's not easy to do in today's culture. It's, it, we're being pushed further and further apart from each other on, a, on an everyday basis. So the Republicans are peddling this idea at the federal level that this is all about freedom and choice. That's their argument. We didn't even have the, this debate. The, this debate did not happen. Freedom and choice. They say you have the freedom to choose what kind of health care you get. You should be able to choose whether or not you're going to buy health insurance. How can the government mandate that I have to buy insurance? How can they mandate that you have to buy insurance that covers mental health or drug and alcohol addiction or maternity care? How can they mandate these type of things? So without that choice, of course, people will make the choice. Young people will say, I'm healthy. I don't have to worry about it. I'll buy health insurance later on in life. I'm not going to get health. I'm fine. I don't need it. And I can save a lot of money. I won't buy insurance. 
And if they're free to make choices, people will say, you know what, if I don't cover mental health, and I don't cover drug and alcohol, and I don't cover this, and I don't cover that, I can save $1,000 a year, or $2,000 a year. I can choose, in my freedom, to choose what I think is best for me. But as everybody in this room knows, inevitably what will happen is one of those young people who didn't buy insurance will have a tragic diagnosis, or be in a horrible accident, or something terrible will happen. Or someone who chose not to have mental health coverage, or drug and alcohol addiction coverage, or some other kind of coverage, will have something they could have never expected happen in their lives, or in their family's life, that's not covered now. And what happens? They could go bankrupt. They go to the emergency room and get treatment that's not as good because they didn't have a primary care physician in the first place, and we all pay for it through the rest of society with much more expensive costs. If people have the choice to choose whether or not they wanted to buy Social Security, don't you think that a lot of people would say, I don't need Social Security. I'll start saving money in five years, or I'll start saving money in 10 years. We need to have these conversations with people and stop writing off with each other and understand what they're talking about and then make the arguments back to them as to why we think that their solutions are wrong-headed. Steve's trying to do that tonight to try and present some of the wrong-headed ideas that are being presented in this country on behalf of the other side that's against the, 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 the bar that wants tort reform that will result in not as much safety. There are people that are pushing for different things that will result in not as much coverage. Uh, we're not gonna win the fight, though, just talking to ourselves. We have to engage with the other side and talk to them in reasonable ways. And, more importantly, gotta win. We've got to win the fight. And it's not going to happen just talking to ourselves. We've got to get more people involved, and you have to organize, and you have to use this political, you know, we just celebrated Memorial Day. And I talked about it in my speeches over Memorial Day. I said, why do we ask young men and women to leave their families, their husbands and wives, or their fiancés, or their girlfriends, or their brothers and sisters, or their mothers and fathers, and go somewhere else, and since the Revolutionary War, one and a half million dead. Why do we do that? for democracy and politics. That's what we asked them to do this for, because this system is so great that we're gonna say, we want you to go die to defend it. Yet we have debased our political system in this country where it's all so petty and so small and so snarky. Instead of working on solving these issues and these problems, I'll tell you one thing, I, 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 I was a local elected official. I'm now on the Foreign Affairs and the Armed Services Committee. I met with General Mattis. I went to Afghanistan. I met. I went to Jordan and Kuwait and the UAE. I met with our soldiers, the healthcare debate. These are life and death matters. These are serious topics. That it's up to the smart people in this room, most of you attorneys and physicians, some of the 5% or 10% smartest people in the country to be engaged and to be effective in trying to fix what is now a broken system in this country. Don't underestimate how powerful you can be in trying to make this system better. But it will only happen if you're engaged from your local races, to your state races, to your federal races. Everybody says, Trump, we're gonna impeach Trump. It's unlikely that that'll happen unless something dramatic happens with this Russian stuff. But it's four years away. It's elections this year. There's elections next year. People have got to stop treating politics like it's some dirty little thing. Looking at the word politics, poly is a Greek word which means of the many. Ticks are blood-sucking insects. <laughs> <laughs> They've got to st stop enjoying that so much. You see, that's the problem. <laughs> we have got to get engaged and make this country work again. But it's only going to be happen, happen by intelligent conversation, intelligent debate, people meeting with each other and talking to people that don't necessarily agree with themselves. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. ...on the key legal and policy matters affecting the city and the state and, and all of our residents, and healthcare is certainly at the center of that, as its complexity and necessity for every single person requires the work of attorneys in a broad spectrum of ways. Steve, along with Dr. Erwin Merkatz, who will be honoring later tonight, have conducted 
truly important work on patient safety intended to guide the medical industry to best practices and to truly understand how to mitigate patient risk. They've worked with a group of advisors from national healthcare organizations, hospitals, insurance companies, risk managers, physicians, nurses, attorneys, and other stakeholders so that the project may, to the greatest extent possible, achieve the aims of promoting the public good. And presently, healthcare is nationally <laughs> and hotly contested domestic. <laughs> The Congressional Budget Office released its score of the legislation passed by the House of Representatives on May 4th, and the Senate is currently debating its own legislative approach. Therefore, it seems especially appropriate in light of these events that today's topic is, can we identify bipartisan common ground that will deliver quality and safe medical care to all Americans? A very good question and a very good topic for tonight. Because at the end, regardless of ideology or perspective, if there is some agreement on fundamental principles and solutions by policymakers from all sides that would best serve the goal of having safe, effective, and accessible health care for all in society, that is a critical goal. To discuss how we may possibly achieve this, we've assembled an exceptional group of panels this evening. We have Congressman Tom Swazi, who represents the 3rd Congressional District on Long Island. He serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, House Armed Services Committee. He's Vice Chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus and Co-Chair of the Quiet Skies Caucus. He's also a CPA and attorney. We also have Assemblyman Richard Godfrey, who is, with 40 years under his belt, the longest serving member of the State Assembly, Chair of the Health Committee, uh, also on the Health I'm sorry, on the uh, Higher Ed and Rules Committee, and has been uh, the driver of uh, the single payer legislation that was recently passed in the Assembly. So thank you for that, Mark. We also have Adam Herbst, who is the Chief Legal Relations and Strategic Planning Officer of Black Dale's Children's Hospital. And he is an adjunct professor here at the law school, and he teaches health law and policy, and he is the co-director of the New York Law School Health Law and Safety project. And we have my good friend Ann Breyer, who has spent the last 40 years in public service and hospital administration in New York City. In 1995, she took on the role of COO at um, the Miami's Medical Center in Brooklyn and then became the president and CEO in 2003 until her retirement just a short time ago in 2016. She is known for innovative approaches to management and public policy strategies. And most recently, she served on the Mayoral Commission on Healthcare for our neighborhood as part of the transformation plan for NYC Health and Hospitals. So, Steve is going to serve as the moderator uh, tonight for what we think will be a highly enlightening conversation. Steve? I hate to start off the evening by contradicting Mardine, but it wasn't my idea to start this. Uh, series of uh, lectures it was actually Dr. Murkatz's idea. So uh, uh, the intersection of law and medicine, and on our first um, program eight years ago, uh, there was a national expert in safety who explained to us uh, uh, what safety, and how it had evolved, and the next morning, um, this uh, expert did grand rounds at uh, Montefiore Medical Center to reinforce uh, safety procedures uh, at uh, Montefiore and Albert Einstein. So uh, I'm sorry, uh, Anthony, to contradict you uh, in that way. But uh, I'd like to uh, uh, start off with uh, going to be starting uh, and finishing um, with Congressman Swanson. Uh, uh, I'd like to start off by asking uh, if Congressman Swanson could explain to us uh, what is the Problem Solvers Caucus? Okay, Steve, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Keep me going here. It's going to be a long night. I want you to be excited from the beginning. So uh, the Problem Solvers Caucus is uh, a 
a group of 22 Democrats and 22 Republicans that are actually trying to talk to each other in the United States Congress. And so we don't think that much of that's going on in this country these days. Uh, I can tell you I've been involved in public service for 25 years. I was a mayor of my hometown for eight years. I was a county executive for eight years. I actually ran for governor of New York State in a Democratic primary against Elliot Spitzer. That did not turn out very well for me. It did not turn out very well for Elliot Spitzer either. <laughs> But I've never seen people as interested in public service and public life as I see right now. And I think Dick would probably agree with me. But people, you know, for different reasons. There are certainly people that are engaged because they're excited about the president. But there are also a lot of people, certainly in New York, that are very engaged because they're terrified. And people are paying attention. I had a town hall meeting last night. I had, must have had 300 some odd people there. And I asked, how many of you have never done anything like this before? And there were, I would say, 60% of the people in the room have never been involved in anything political ever before in their life. And I've, this is my sixth town hall that I had where I had a similar experience like that. So people are very engaged right now, and people want problems solved. I tell my Republican colleagues, I said, you know, this was not a big Republican victory. This was a Donald Trump victory. And you happen to be the beneficiaries of it. But the people are sick and tired of the Democrats and the Republicans in Congress. Congress has a 14 percent approval rating. It's like it's a little bit higher than fungus and, uh, and the New York State Assembly. So, <laughs> so people are just sick of government and politics and they want problems solved. And there are people, there are Republicans, and there are Democrats that are actually trying to talk to each other. Now right now the main initiatives are to talk about tax reform and infrastructure. Um, Health care, there was a specific effort by the President and by Speaker Paul Ryan that said, listen, don't talk to the Democrats. We'll handle this ourselves. And, uh, and it was a strategy, quite frankly, by Chuck Schumer at the beginning of the year that said that the Democrats were not going to propose an alternative to what the Republicans were proposing at this time because they've been complaining for seven years about the Affordable Care Act, which I believe has uh, uh, had great success in many, many different ways. There are problems with it. We need to amend it, not end it. Um, but uh, they forced the Republicans to come up with their proposal the proposal they came up with, which is consistent with what they've been talking about for years, has been an abject failure. I mean, the, the failure from the perspective of what it does, as the Dean mentioned in the opening remarks, but a failure from a political perspective, and that less than 20% of Americans support what they've done. Um, so the Problem Solvers Caucus is really, there's an institutional problem that exists in the United States Congress. There's very little time for you to actually sit and talk to your colleagues. I'm a freshman congressman, I've been here, or whatever the number is, since January 3rd, 100 and some odd days. And uh, 45,000 people have contacted my office. I have 1,200 outstanding meeting requests. Uh, I'm very busy on my committees related to uh, armed services and foreign affairs. It's one of your main obligations to work on your committees. You have to decide how you're gonna use your time. I've decided I'm gonna focus a lot of my energy and attention on this idea of the Problem Solvers Caucus. And we've had a, an, an initial success related to the budget for 2017. There was, a, there was very little news about it, thank goodness. There was going to be a, a crisis of shutting down the government uh, a few weeks ago. The Problem Solvers Caucus got more than 75% of the votes of its members to say we would support the budget moving forward, consistent with what it had been previously, if there were no ideological writers in there, nothing about the wall, nothing about any Democratic or Republican initiatives. And those 44 votes were enough, I believe, to persuade a lot of our colleagues that we should just pass a budget, keep the, budget, the government open through the remainder of 2017, instead of letting the, the Freedom Caucus hijack the process. Um, so the Problem Solvers Caucus is an effort to try and end it. There's a group called No Labels, which is a national group that is trying to promote this. Within the Congress, there's this group of the Problem Solvers Caucus we are trying to become a block of votes that will vote together to be a uh, counterbalance to the Freedom Caucus uh, with some moderate Republicans, uh, some of many of whom voted against the uh, Republican health care bill. Uh, not all of them, but many of them did. Uh, to try and be a, a group of people that can be relied upon to try and be reasonable. There has been no conversation whatsoever about health care at this time amongst that group yet. Just so toxic, and the way that the politics was from the Republican side mainly, but also the Democratic side, that we were not going to uh, uh, engage at this stage. Before um, leaving, 
to, uh, go to uh, special guests. Uh, um, a couple of comments. Uh, the goal of the Affordable Care Act uh, was to increase coverage so all Americans would have affordable access to health care to improve the quality of that care and to tame and control rising costs. Uh, some of those goals were partially achieved, uh, 20 million more um, uh, Americans who did not have insurance now have insurance to be Affordable Care Act or Medicaid coverage. Um, but uh, some 25 million remain uninsured. Um, so uh, 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 we'll skip past uh, the bill recently passed uh, in the House called the uh, uh, American Health Care Act. Uh, we'll try to avoid calling one bill Obamacare and the other bill uh, Trump Care. We'll call them by their real names. Uh, but uh, um, before I leave you, coming back to you, um, good health is defined as a state of physical, mental, and social well being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Uh, only a healthy individual can contribute to a healthy family, and only a healthy family can contribute to a healthy community. So when we come back to you, it will be, it will be in the context of uh, you were the mayor of the community for many years. You are the mayor of a larger community when you were county executive. And, um, and well now, with your colleagues, uh, you have the responsibility to an even larger community, all of the American people. And uh, so, um, when we come back to you, uh, we'll see if you accept our, uh, uh, our uh, uh, challenge, so to speak. Try to make uh, a healthy community in every uh, corner of this country. If there's one thing that I'm very convinced of, having been a local mayor and a county executive who's responsible for the social services, the health and human services of my county, social services, health, mental health, veterans, seniors, youth, physically challenged, drug and alcohol, is that the real big focus of health care needs to be prevention and it needs to be focused on the whole person. Uh, a lot of tying in health care and social service issues uh, together. If you look at the main reasons for premature death uh, in, in the world, you know, 40% of the deaths are related to uh, behavior. So smoking, we take for granted, you know, how, how, what a, what a, what a, uh, how much we abhor smoking in New York. Well, we don't have the laws throughout the rest of the country that we have regarding smoking in the rest of the country. Uh, overeating, lack of exercise, uh, these are really big issues that can be addressed, need to be addressed as part of any comprehensive effort. Uh, and having access, for everyone to have access to basic primary care is a very big part of prevention uh, to try and uh, make sure people are healthy. We were talking about earlier, that state of mind, by having access like that. So prevention is a very big part of it. Uh, this was from the Journal of American Medicine. I was just reading something that I was reading in preparation for this. 40% of premature deaths are related to behavior. 30% are related to genetics. 10% are related to lack of treatment. Uh, other, other factors related to environment and, and societal issues. The, the audience um, should note, even if you can't see it directly, that the document was shaking the said yes, 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 with each one of those comments. Um, I do, uh, I'm gonna call on Dr. Jives, and I want to make certain he has um, a microphone. Um, now, I believe you will all be able to hear him. Uh, if anyone cannot, please raise your
raise your hand and I'll, I'll jump in. Dr. Judge, you have double duty. You are going to first tell us what Dr. Fanneroff wanted to communicate to this audience. Just to give the background, Dr. Avroy Fanaroff has been the director of uh, neonatology at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital for many years, and a close friend of Dr. Merkatz since Dr. Merkatz moved to Cleveland. And I have his written comments here. My name is Avroy Fanaroff, and I am proud to call Erwin Merkatz a friend and colleague. I'm sorry that I cannot be present physically tonight, but will congratulate you on your decision to honor him. He is richly deserving of the honor bestowed on him this evening because he is visionary and a giant amongst his peers who advanced perinatal care. The term neonatology was coined in 1960, but at that time newborns were under the care of obstetric residents who had limited, limited skills and no interest in this task. Over the next decade, neonatal intensive care expanded the pediatricians took over the management of sick newborns. The next important phase was the development of neonatal perinatal medicine, whereby obstetricians with special skills in maternal fetal medicine and neonatologists combined their skills and expertise. Irwin was a pioneer in the field of maternal fetal medicine. In Cleveland, the key to the evolution of neonatal perinatal medicine and regionalization of perinatal care was the high level of communication of obstetricians led by Drs. Erwin Merkatz and Michael Jives and the neonatologists under the stewardship of Drs. Avroy Fanaroff, Marshall Klaus, Richard Martin, and Maureen Hack. In the early 1970s, the evidence for many of the treatments were based on anecdotes rather than randomized trials. The combined weekly Tuesday meeting of obstetric, pediatric, <coughs> nursing, and ancillary personnel led to lively discussions and the search for an evidence-based <coughs> manner of treatment for high-risk pregnant women and their vulnerable offspring. There were many heated discussions with all seeking the best outcomes for our patients. To develop the data, our center participated in the important randomized trials on the use of tocolytic agents to prolong premature labor, use of antenatal corticosteroids in premature labor, and the management of diabetic pregnancies. From these discussions arose the concept of regionalization of perinatal care, as our center received critically ill women and babies who could have benefited from the expertise in earlier interventions by our staff. Stimulated by grants from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the process of regionalization was accelerated. The pillars of regionalization included uniform access of all pregnant women to the highest quality of care. This would require movement of high-risk pregnancies to centers of excellence. Other features included, first, central laboratories with exemplary standards of care, second, a unified record-keeping record system, such as the early electronic health record with specially designed forms by Hobel and O, modified by Merkex. And third, regional education. Improving the quality of perinatal education was an early goal. Two textbooks from the Cleveland Center, Klaus and Fanaroff's Care of the High-Risk Neonate, and Bierman's Neonatal Perinatal Medicine, state-of-the-art third edition, edited by Fanaroff and Martin, with Merkatz as associate editor, became the international standard and were translated into many languages. Two volume 11th edition is now in the planning process. 
The final important piece of the puzzle was to design a high-risk follow-up program which would provide the yardstick for the quality of care. The goal was not just to improve the number of survivors, but the number of survivors free of disability. As noted in an article in the New England Journal of Medicine of November 22, 1979, written by Maureen Hack, Adroy Fanneroff, and Erwin Mertatz, entitled Low Birth Weight Infant, Evolution of the Changing Outlook, quote, since the costs of sustaining life for such small and immature infants are enormous, the investment of money and manpower would be difficult to justify if, indeed, the long-term outlook is less than favorable. Reassuringly, most current follow-up studies demonstrate that accompanying the improved survival, there is a reduction in handicap, close quote. This follow-up program in Cleveland has been sustained for 40 years. Many of the subjects have been followed into adult life. Initiated by the late Dr. Maureen Hack, it is considered one of the premier follow-up programs in the world. I remain grateful for the many years we've worked together and offer my sincerest congratulations to a dear friend and colleague. Dr. Jives. Let me interrupt before you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your uh, interaction with Dr. Marquez. Uh, key to our discussion here today uh, is the concept of not allowing uh, a woman or her child before or after birth to be at a disadvantage because they lived some distance from the hospital. So we will be talking in a broader scope of uh, not allowing uh, patients to be at a disadvantage because they don't have coverage. Uh, also, studies were used to prove that these efforts actually save lives and produced among those children who survived less handicap. Correct. So someone such as Congressman Swazi is interested in having value for money that's spent. And here we have proof uh, there is value in what was created, <coughs> this perinatal interaction between high-risk obstetricians and high-risk pediatricians. Unlike some Democrats and Republicans, they've been talking to one another about the best interests of their patients. And lo and behold, it turns out that it works. So, okay. Now, now it's your turn to tell us about yourself and Dr. Merkins. Okay, well, uh, let me pause and start over by um, thanking Dr. Merkins and Mr. Pigalis for giving me the opportunity to participate in this celebration of Dr. Merkins' legacy. Erwin, you deserve all the honor that's being just bestowed upon you. As Mr. Pigalis said, I'm, I'm Michael Jives. A retired obstetrician gynecologist from Shaker Heights, Ohio, who was born, raised, and educated in the Bronx. And Dr. Erwin Merkatz is my mentor. We became acquainted 50 years ago during my third year of medical school at Cornell, where Dr. Merkatz was a member of the faculty. And we got to know each other well during my residency at the New York Hospital. But then in 1973, we both left New York. Dr. Merkatz from Cleveland, to be the director of obstetrics at University Hospitals of Cleveland. And I went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma to serve two years at an OBGYN at Reynolds Army Hospital. When my time in the Army was winding down, I was looking at practice opportunities because my career plan was private practice. But that wasn't going to happen. 
because I ran into Dr. Burkett's at a very name symposium in San Diego. And he recruited me to join him in Cleveland. He said, Mike, come to Cleveland. We're doing great things. We're starting a perinatal fellowship. You can be a fellow. We'll have a great time. Now, at that time, a career in academic medicine was the last thing on my mind. But if you know Dr. Merkatz, you know he can be very persuasive. And so in 1975, when I was discharged from the Army, I became Dr. Merkatz's first fellow in maternal fetal medicine in Cleveland. Well, those were exciting times. Maternal fetal medicine was in its infancy. Dr. Merkatz was a leader among those who were advancing the quality and the scope of care for pregnant women. His contributions to prenatal diagnosis, to the management of diabetes in pregnancy, management of preterm labor are all well known. He was also a pioneer in promoting, promoting the concept of regionalization uh, to improve outcomes for high-risk pregnancy. And, and just to explain, regionalization is the concept in which you have centers of excellence prepared to receive high-risk pregnant women or high-risk newborns from the surrounding community to provide for them the best care that's possible. Dr. Murkatz established a perinatal center in Cleveland to serve all of Northeast Ohio. And he labored tirelessly to educate the physicians of the community about the benefits of regionalization. It wasn't a foregone conclusion at that time. And in the process, he developed the Cleveland Regional Perinatal Network. But we all worked hard. We were traveling around Northeast Ohio, meeting with and lecturing with community physicians. But nobody worked harder than Dr. Marquez. He set the standard. He was my role model. Through all of this, Dr. Marquez was teaching me and guiding me into a career in academic medicine, a career that I wouldn't have pursued without his guidance. But he's done this over and over again with many young physicians, nurturing them, guiding them, and then they have gone on and they have propagated his legacy such that his own contributions to the field of obstetrics have multiple, been multiplied many times over. My own career has been very rewarding. I particularly loved resident teaching, following the example of my mentor. Uh, there's a special gratification in knowing that there are well-qualified obstetrician gynecologists all over the country in whose education and training you've had some small part. You might say that resident teaching is like paying it forward. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I think patient care is also very rewarding, and direct patient care has been a major part of my professional life. But to me, resident teaching is special. And just think, I wouldn't have been doing that. I wouldn't have been in academic medicine and so involved in resident education if Dr. Marquez had not recruited me. So, Erwin, thank you. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for teaching me, for guiding me, and as you've done for so many others, thank you for giving me the opportunity to pay it forward. drove here from Ohio, and I was not going to cut him down on his time, uh, um, but uh, I am uh, from now on uh, uh, cutting down on the time of, uh, of, of our others. Uh, we're working our way um, back to Congressman Swansea and uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Jives just gave us uh, an insight uh, into the 
idea that uh, it doesn't just happen that uh, um, there's leadership, uh, mentorship, and uh, uh, the next generation and then the next generation of superior healthcare givers. And, um, uh, and it was not an act of Congress. We're talking uh, tonight about an act of Congress, but it was not an act of Congress that uh, created uh, this uh, uh, background. Um, uh, I don't know why they didn't come up with uh, perinatal medicine before you and uh, Dr. Fanoff and your colleagues we're putting it together, but whatever. Uh, I, I don't know why it took so long to come up with the Affordable Care Act, but um, whatever. I know. But, no, <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm not going to ask him why. <laughs> That's another. And that always thing. follow the money. Things that haven't changed for 30 or 40 years, uh, there is someone who likes the status quo. There's people that benefit from the status quo. Okay. When you want to check, you want to try and change the status quo. Someone's benefiting from the status quo the way it is now. Whether it's climate change, health insurance, gun violence, whatever the issue is, someone's benefiting from the way it is now. They want to keep it the way. It is. Immigration. Someone likes it the way it is now. They're going to do everything they can to keep it the way it is now. Well, I'm going to next call on Dr. Fleischman. Alan, please do not this place. And. Um, they uh, go on the idea that they want better care, better health, and smarter spending. And it includes a process in which there are quick adjustments in response to feedback from clinicians and patients. So they include, for example, the doctors, they include the patients. And uh, the idea is that they want to pay for value and not value. Uh, my question to you is, uh, do you know of any alternative to this approach? Well, <laughs> we've tried all the other ones. This is the right one. Uh, well, what, what would you think of an act of Congress that, that decided to abandon this approach and just let it wing its way wherever it winds up. Well, those of us who have been caring for patients in New York, and I would say around the whole country, are frightened. Um, we know the critical nature of the Medicaid enhancements. We know that the majority of states, but not all of them, have taken that on to the benefit of the patients in those states. Um, we know that gathering evidence, what we call comparative effectiveness research to enhance value, was a critical part of the Affordable Care Act. Without those, that kind of evidence, we will not be able to move forward. With decimation of Medicaid and with 24 or 23 million people coming off health insurance, if we at the present House bill, um, America's in some real trouble. Um, I'm going to cut you off and go to our next speaker. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And um, um, Dr. Shazad has been in this room before, at Dr. Merkatz's request, to speak about a just culture of safety. It, it gets the attention of lawyers when the doctor speaks about justice. Would you um, tell us just of all things you said to me the other day, um, the C 
celebrate our errors. What on earth do you mean by that? Okay. Well, before I start with celebrating errors, I think I have to say a few words about that. The word events. Um, it was 1982, I was a young resident physician, and this man came from Cleveland to chair our department. Um, he came with a background in regionalization, in social justice, in caring for women, in developing high-risk pregnancy programs, and here we landed in the Bronx, in the probably one of the poorest congressional districts in the whole country. Lots of work to be done. Our outcomes for mothers and children only rival the outcomes of my colleagues from Brooklyn. The two outer boroughs, the two outer boroughs are always battling for um, the most difficult cases to care for these women. Um, Dr. Marquette's brought um, a social justice to care for excellent care for all women of the Bronx. Um, and in addition, and this is where I'm getting to your question, um, he extended this concept of justice to his faculty and to all the physicians that worked in his department. He created an environment where we could develop our quality assurance programs in the concept of just culture. And what does that mean? As, I, as you alluded to, Steve, it means that we are free to celebrate our errors. We are free to learn from our errors. And we are free of punishment for our errors. We as physicians come to work every day to do the best for our patients, to do the best for our colleagues. We want to be in an environment where to err is human, and humans make mistakes. We need to learn from those mistakes. We need to put systems in place to prevent those mistakes from occurring. I counseled a young resident um, just last week who could have done things a little differently. And I said to her, we're here to celebrate this because if you did this wrong, don't you know 10 of your colleagues have probably done it wrong too? And by learning and by looking and putting new systems in place, we can improve the healthcare for all women and all folks. Thank you. Let, let me, well, wait a minute, get out of the oh, book here. Prominent physicians affiliated with the Institute of Medicine um, creating this idea of a just culture of safety cited that a prior culture of self-regulation among physicians when rates of injury from errors in care were high enough to make care a public menace required to change. Interesting, we're talking about laws and regulations. Um, the medical profession Deans in the medical profession. Uh, they said that. Uh, uh, Self-regulation um, hasn't been working. And they called for a culture of safety, and people such as yourself said they uh, um, took it to heart. And um, uh, we don't need law to um, uh, require um, our health care providers now to uh, um, be careful, uh, to pay attention to a culture of safety. Uh, Dr. Merkatz um, uh, uh, inspired, among others, Dr. Shazad, uh, who um, hopefully, uh, when I say hopefully, has been inspiring others because uh, I understand you're going to be retiring soon. That's correct. Uh, however, this is a serious note, uh, you will continue, that's what you told me, to uh, uh, be a consultant on a number of issues, among which Maternal mortality. Um, uh, serious stuff. Right. 
So there are many efforts within the state, um, with the New York State Department of Health, New York City Department of Health, to work collaboratively and interprofessionally. And I think this is where we're, we're heading, and I will continue with that work. Well, Inspired by Dr. Marquez and um, his, his concern for maternal health as well as fetal health. Cindy, I'm going to pick up on that later. You'll, you'll see uh, why I, I brought that up. Uh, later to thank you so much again for being here and uh, at New York Law School and, and uh, uh, participating in our program. <laughs>